Good morning. I'm LaShondra Shaw, PIO for the City of Austin, and I am the moderator for today's media availability. Spanish interpretation is available on ATXN3. To start, Austin Public Health Director Stephanie Hayden Howard will first say a few words, followed by Dr. Mark Escott, interim Austin Travis County Health Authority, followed by Janet Pichette, Austin Public Health Chief Epidemiologist. We will then open it up to our pool reporter who will ask questions on behalf of the media. Stephanie, over to you. Good morning. We know that there are some concerns about the weather. We are going to continue to monitor the weather to just determine how it would affect our um, vaccine appointments um, from today through Tuesday of next week. Um, in the event that inclement weather causes us to make a change with our schedule, we will notify individuals by email, text, and phone call. We ultimately want everyone to remain safe in the event an individual decides they will not be able to make their appointment. Um, they can just reach out to us and let us know and we will reschedule them. Um, as we move forward during the week, um, we will continue to provide our um, vaccines next week. One of the things I wanted to share today is my concern about the number of African Americans that are receiving the vaccine. I'm also concerned about the number of Hispanics that are receiving the vaccines. It is going to be important for us as Austin Public Health um, to continue to work with the communities and be able to meet people where they are. Um, we know that um, we have been having some challenges with the system. And so what we have put in place is, is that we have established an equity phone call line. And this line is going to be for outbound calls. That process did start about two weeks ago. Um, and we have established more people um, to provide outgoing calls. We know that there are some additional partnerships that we are going to work with, and we will continue to work through our task force that have been established, as well as our vaccine coalition. At this time, I will transition over to Dr. Escott. Good morning. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm pleased to report that our cases continue to decrease. Yesterday, we dropped below 300 on the moving average of new cases in Travis County for the first time since December the 9th. Our hospital admissions are dropping, our hospitalizations are dropping, our ICU utilization and ventilator use are all dropping. But it's important to remember that we can't let up yet. Uh, in particular, we're concerned about the B117 variant, which we know is in this community. We know it's around Texas, about 45, uh, 44 cases so far detected in the state of Texas. That means we have to continue those protective actions, the masking, the distancing, the uh, washing your hands frequently, avoid touching your face, and staying home when people are sick. If we continue those protective actions, then by the time we hit March and April, we'll be in a much better situation in our community, and we can really decrease the uh, the impact of COVID-19. So we need folks to, to stay on board, to stay vigilant, and we'll all get through this together. With that, I'll transition over to Janet Pichette. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to kind of piggyback off of what Dr. Escott had to say, and that is, uh, even though we do have vaccines uh, available to us, and, uh, you know, we see a uh, remarkable number of cases, our cases are dropping remarkably, Is it's a good sign for us in our community. Uh, however, we do know that there are new variants circulating and we need to continue to be vigilant uh, with the number of uh, prevention activities that we follow to reduce disease transmission risks in your family. Um, one thing we need to be mindful as you venture out, you need to make sure that you are following those prevention measures. 
uh, that we always uh, discuss, you know, keeping, making sure you're socially distanced, distancing and uh, wearing your mask uh, and staying home if you're ill, most importantly. Um, you know, if you, if you gather, we still recommend that you, your social gatherings, uh, as we do our case investigations, we're seeing a lot of transmission risks still occurring with social gatherings and, and clusters related to that. So we're asking people to continue to gather with those people in their household only uh, and limit their exposure, uh, thus limiting uh, the spread of COVID-19. Um, I would like to also provide one additional reminder that has been related to weather and that many of our, our Austin Public Health testing sites are currently uh, closed due to inclement weather, but you can check our, uh, our uh, website to make sure uh, to see when uh, they open back up. And with that, I'll, I'll move on to our moderator. Thank you, Janet. At this time, Louis Acosta from Univision will now ask questions on behalf of the media. Louis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to each of you for taking the time to answer our questions and for keeping us up to date providing these weekly updates. Our first question is from our station at Univision. Some doctors have mentioned that immunity after both doses could last as short as three months. Do you have an update as to how long immunity could last once individuals get both doses? Uh, I'm having to take that question. You know, the vaccine is new, and uh, I, I think we're going to have to be patient to wait on the data uh, to determine the length of, of protection. Uh, you know, we've we've only started vaccinating here uh, locally over the past uh, month or two, uh, and certainly nationally, uh, we're in the same situation. Uh, so as we go through the months. Uh, we'll gain better knowledge, better data on how long that immunity will last. Uh, I, I think it's clear that it's not 100% with any of the vaccines. Uh, so right now we really focus on getting folks vaccinated as quickly as we can, but also reminding our community that even once you're vaccinated, you need to continue to follow those, those precautions, the masking, the distancing, the hand hygiene. Um, we're, I think it's likely that, that uh, the immunity from vaccines will last, last much longer than three months. But also it's important to remember that the immunity with any vaccine is variable across the community. Some people will develop uh, longer lasting immunity, others shorter. Uh, and you know, you'll have some circumstances where uh, even after two vaccine doses, some individuals may not uh, have a significant uh, antibody response. Uh, so we'll be watching all those things as as the months continue. And again, we're all hopeful that, uh, that the immunity is, is lasting much longer than three months. All right, our next question is from Community Impact. How many people have been connected to vaccine appointments as a result of the new vaccine phone bank? I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? Yes, next question is from Community Impact. How many people have been connected to vaccine appointments as a result of the new vaccine phone bank? Well, I, to be honest with you, we did not bring that data um, to this uh, meeting. Um, I would have to get with that team to establish that. I will um, tell you um, that when we first um, stood up our process, uh, the first day that that line was open, it received over 2,500 calls. Um, and it was so many calls that it was of great concern, not only to Austin Public Health, but into the, for the entire city. And so um, one of the things that we know is, is definitely we had to um, establish two other mechanisms uh, one is the inbound calls uh, for the nursing line, uh, the equity line that is making outbound calls, and then the third line uh, with the partnership with uh, Travis County to make outbound calls as well. That allows us to um, be able to, to reach people um, immediately. 
whether they are re referred to us by grassroots organizations um, or have left a message with us um, via 311. And so our staff um, will continue to um, reach out proactively and schedule those appointments um, in order to ensure from an equity perspective, as well as individuals that don't have access to the internet um, to schedule their appointments. And I'll just add, um, I know I've heard a lot of concerns about uh, people who are trying to scam individuals or um, people who are taking it upon themselves to schedule appointments for uh, the elderly at, at, a, at a cost. We do not recommend this activity or you participate or ha pay someone to help you schedule your appointment um, because uh, oftentimes they're taking their money and when they get to the uh, clinical location, they're not, there's no appointment available for them. Uh, and it's very uh, frustrating for both us to witness and for the, in the, those individuals impacted. Um, you know, I will say that Austin Public Health, when they do reach out to individuals, will not be asking for financial information. We will not be asking for immigration status. Uh, or social security numbers. So please keep that in mind that if somebody is asking for that information, uh, we would not be doing that. Our next question is from CBS Austin. Is APH planning to cancel vaccine appointments because of bad weather and unsafe driving conditions? And how will rescheduling them affect other appointments already scheduled? We are going to monitor the weather, um, the upcoming days. Um, what we have established is, is to ensure the health and safety of our community. In the event we have to cancel a day, um, we've made modifications in the schedule um, that are starting effective February 15th. And that modification will allow us to meet the demand, even if we have to reschedule some of the appointments. Our next question is from KXAN. How far away are we from moving to the next group, 1C, of people getting vaccinated, and who will be in that group? I'm happy to take that one. Uh, you know, at, at this stage, there is no 1C for the state of Texas. Uh, the vaccine uh, expert vaccine allocation panel is, is looking at uh, 1C. Uh, you know, I anticipate that somewhere around early March, we may see rollout of 1C as more people in the 1B group uh, are vaccinated. Uh, the federal strategy has been to do 1B and 1C in parallel. And the reason is, uh, you know, when you focus on the 1B group, in particular individuals over the age of 65, uh, the modeling suggests that you decrease mortality by one to 4%. If you focus on essential workers, uh, those who are more likely to be exposed and to spread COVID-19, you decrease transmission by one to 5%. Uh, the federal government is sort of splitting the difference and, and focusing on both at the same time. I anticipate that uh, the state will follow suit similarly uh, and not wait for 1B to be completed before moving on to 1C. Uh, I anticipate it will be essential workers uh, they may provide specific recommendations for which groups of essential workers, uh, but certainly uh, we recognize that we have a, a lot of people working on the front lines in restaurants, in, uh, you know, as, as bus drivers, construction, a lot of other individuals who are still out working uh, that have an exposure risk, and, and we would like to get to them as soon as we can. Our next question is from KUT. COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations have been going down. Why is that? Are we just far out enough from the holidays or other factors are at play? Well, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to think that this has a lot to do with our community responding to the call for action. Uh, we saw 
uncontrolled surge in, in December and January uh, to the point where our hospitals were, were overflowing and, and we had to activate the alternate care site. Um, you know, I think that, that people in our community heard that message. I think they responded. I think they stayed home when they could. I think they kept their kids home and, and transitioned to virtual if they could. Uh, I think people are masking here. I think they're distancing. I think they're following guidelines. Uh, and I think that has led Austin in particular and, and Travis County uh, to following more aggressively than, than some other jurisdictions. Again, our area was the last metropolitan jurisdiction in the state of Texas to enter into surge with hospitalizations for COVID-19 over 15% of total hospital capacity. And we were the first to come out of it. Uh, but again, uh, we've been in this situation in the past where cases were dropping, we relaxed too much, and cases uh, have gone up again. So we've got to stay the course and, uh, and continue those protections that have gotten us uh, to this place. We're pleased to see uh, cases dropping around the state of Texas and around the country. Uh, certainly those are happening at, at different rates in different jurisdictions. Uh, but we're proud of, of what our community has done and, and uh, we're hopeful that they will continue that call to action uh, until we can get down to stage three and then stage two at least. And I'll just echo what Dr. Escott had to say. I think um, we're very fortunate to have a community that is responding to our call to action for public, you know, implementing public health measures to protect themselves and their loved ones. Uh, you know, I see that based on the response for vaccine, uh, people want the vaccine and they want to return to normalcy. Uh, again, we need to continue to be vigilant to make sure that we prevent and reduce disease transmission risks, especially as we have these new variants beginning to circulate in our community. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, I'm optimistic to see the, the numbers uh, drop dramatically. Um, I do often meet with other state epidemiolo epidemiologists throughout the state and other metropolitan areas. And uh, they ask me all the time, what is, what is it that you're doing in Austin? And I feel like we have a very responsive community that cares about our other community members. So I want to thank uh, our community for uh, following those prevention activities. Our next question is from Coop. A new preliminary study suggests that the B117 Kent various variant, which can double every 10 days, is active in the US. What evidence is there of this variant being active in Travis County? Um, I'm happy to take that. Again, we've got multiple cases confirmed here. Uh, we've got 44 around the state as of yesterday. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean there's only 44 cases. That means we only have identified 44, uh, which means that there's a lot more than that. Uh, again, it's it's hard to, to know what percentage uh, at this stage is, is the 117 variant. Uh, the state is working on uh, increasing their genomic surveillance. Uh, so that's the testing of, of the positive uh, COVID tests for uh, genomic se sequencing to find out how many are 117 or other variants versus the, uh, the original strain. Uh, and we're hopeful that they will do that. Right now there is less than 1% of, of COVID tests which are, uh, th that undergo sequencing. The state would like to get to 1%, uh, but we are not there yet. Uh, so again, this is part of an overall uh, uh, public health strategy, uh, biodefense strategy uh, that the state needs, that we need as a country in order to monitor these, these uh, variants. Uh, again, this will become critical, particularly in the future, if we end up in a, in a flu-like uh, circumstance where we have seasonal COVID, uh, where we can detect variants and we can formulate uh, booster vaccines uh, to identify the, the prevalent strains uh, for the, the coming season. 
Um, and I'd just like to add, we are looking forward to DISHES being able to have the capacity to uh, do that gen genomic uh, sequencing to see if uh, we have other strains in the community. I can say from our case investigation uh, that uh, the cases that we've had here have not had any travel outside of the United States. And so uh, with that, um, it appears that, you know, it's been circulating here. So I'm, I'm sure there are more cases in Travis County and throughout Central Texas. Uh, they've just not been able to identify them because uh, the capacity for genomic se sequencing hasn't been uh, performed on their actual specimens. Our next question is from the Austin American Statesman. Some Austin Travis County residents were very confused this week about second doses, saying the CDC guidelines that Dr. Mark Escott quoted Tuesday about a 42nd, 42 day grace period is only according to the CDC. If it is not feasible to adhere to a recommended interval and a delay in vaccination is unavoidable. Can you please clarify this process for residents about the efficacy of second doses if they had to wait longer for them? Again, uh, I'm happy to take this one. You know, we certainly prefer to to get uh, the second doses as close to the the 28 day interval as possible. Uh, CDC has been very clear; it shouldn't happen before 28 days, but can happen after up to 42 days. Uh, so we're working hard to, to to try to get it as close to to that as possible. But it's important to remember that that immunity isn't falling between the first dose and the second dose. The evidence suggests it's actually increasing. Uh, so we look at less than 14 days after the first dose of the Moderna vaccine, the vaccine efficacy is about 50 to 51 percent. Uh, when we get out to over 14 days, uh, it's about 92 percent. Uh, overall, a single dose of Moderna, at least in a small portion of of the, uh, the uh, vaccine, uh, the, the studies of the vaccine uh, indicates that it's 80% uh, effective at, at preventing COVID-19 with a single dose. Um, so again, there is flexibility in that second dose. Uh, we will work hard to, to get people in as soon as possible, uh, at, you know, as, as close as possible to the 28 days. It may be 28 days, it may be 30 days, it may be 35 days. Uh, it, it's all going to be within the 42-day the window for certain. Uh, but uh, it, I imagine in most circumstances, it's going to be within a, a week of, of that due date. We're going to start our second round of questions. This next question comes from Univision. Can you provide more details on new strategies being implemented for outreach regarding the vaccine administration in Hispanic communities. Um, the, the department um, established um, several months ago the Latinx Hispanic um, Task Force Group. Um, that group uh, does meet uh, a few times a month. Um, recommendations are provided um, to the leadership of Austin Public Health, and those recommendations um, are shared with the um, Vaccine Coalition group. What we've also done also is, is um, we have members from the Hispanic and Latin communities that are part of the Vaccine um, Coalition. In addition to that, um, we have several um, nonprofit partners that um, provide us um, input about um, work that we are doing. Um, we have many grants that will um, be begin to start providing education um, as well as outreach in our community. And I'll also mention um, we, we continue to work with, with other smaller groups. Uh, I am working with a, a group from the U.S. Hispanic Contractors Association and some other partners uh, to start planning for that 1C phase uh, when we can offer vaccines to, uh, to larger groups of, of essential workers like construction 
Uh, we need to have a, a plan in place, and uh, I've been very pleased with the discussions that, that we've been having. Um, you know, we've got more work to do in terms of, of planning, uh, but we're hopeful, again, that, that by, you know, the first or second week of March, we, we will be able to start to roll out uh, vaccines to some of those essential workers. Uh, we're particularly focused on construction workers because of the, the great work that the University of Texas has done on, on modeling of, of the impact of COVID-19 on construction workers. And uh, we feel that, that uh, focusing some efforts on that group uh, will help us to, to get vaccine to our Latinx community. We'll also have a significant impact overall on, uh, on our disease transmission in, in Austin and Travis County. Uh, so we look forward to, to ongoing collaborations with them. Our next question is from CBS Austin. How is hospital capacity, capacity doing with so many weather related car crashes on top of COVID-19 cases? Uh, the hospitals are doing fine right now. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, when we look at, at big accidents like the one that happened on, uh, on 45 uh, yesterday morning, uh, there were a lot of cars, but relatively few people hurt. Um, again, as, as we go in, into the colder weather uh, and, and we have ice, uh, we also see slips and falls, uh, so we need people to continue to be careful on the roads, be careful when they're leaving their house, walking their dog, uh, lots and lots of falls associated with people walking their dogs and, and slipping on ice. Uh, so again, we need, we need our community to continue to, to use caution uh, with the inclement weather. Uh, and uh, we all know Texas and we know that, uh, you know, in a few days it will change. Um, so again, uh, Hospitals are looking fine at this stage. Our next question is from KXAN. Given that cases are dropping, do you plan to close the convention center hospital? Uh, we're going to continue to monitor the situation for the alternate care site. Uh, you know, the, the number of patients in that facility has remains steady around 35 to 40 uh, over the past week or so. Uh, again, uh, that, that site is able to support not only the Austin and Travis County community, uh, but it can also have the capacity to, to take patients from other areas that are, are still underserved. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor the situation and you know, we expect that uh, as those numbers drop that, that we may consider uh, putting it back in, in reserves. Uh, so hopefully have more on that in a week or two. Our next question is from KUT. Last week you said APH is proactively reaching out to pre-registered 80 year olds to help them schedule appointments. One, once you've gotten through the list of 80 year olds, what priority group will you focus on next? We, um, we definitely want to continue to uh, focus um, some of our efforts on um, individuals that are 65 years of age and older, but it is definitely going to be important for us to start to focus it in on individuals that are 64 years of age and younger. One of my concerns, as I shared earlier, is that um, we need to increase the number of African Americans as well as Hispanic populations that have been disproportionately um, represented in the data um, because we need to address how we can increase the number of African Americans and Hispanics that are receiving the vaccine. So it's going to be important for us to use that equity line that we have established um, to reach those populations. It's also going to be important for us um, to continue our um, task force um, with the um, African-American diaspora group, as well as the um, Latinx Hispanic group. Make sure um, any kind of flexible changes that we need to make, because we need to be nimble in our operations. 
And so we are going to continue to modify our operations to increase um, enrollment on our platform, work with partners to um, do more outreach and engagement so we can increase those numbers. And I'll, I'll add on to that as well. Uh, you know, when we look at, at the, uh, the, the vaccine that's been given out here in, in Austin and Travis County so far, about 70% of that vaccine has gone to individuals 65 and older. Uh, and we do continue to, to want to focus on that group because of the risk associated with severe illness and death in that age group. Uh, but as the hospital uh, hospital systems start to in, improve in terms of uh, the numbers of, of hospital beds being occupied, uh, we also have to take into account that individuals who are 64 and younger are more likely to still be in the workforce uh, who are in that 1B group. So not only do they have the, the risk of severe illness and death, but they also have a higher risk in, in many circumstances of exposure because they're still working, because they're still uh, working in face-to-face frontline uh, areas. And so it's important that we start to shift uh, our, our strategy uh, to include more individuals who are still 1B, but younger than 65, to start to create that balance uh, and uh, ensure that, that we can have an effective strategy as we move through this pandemic. Uh, again, we anticipate that our strategies will have to continue to, to change and be modified to meet the changing needs in this community. Uh, and Austin Public Health is certainly committed to uh, making those modifications. Our next question comes from Co-op. As vaccines become more ready available, is it not prudent to inoculate the families and caregivers of those in phase one and one B? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, what, what you, you definitely want to be is in a place where you take advantage of uh, the caregivers that are providing that service to our elderly population. Um, one of the things that um, we are, are working on and have started that process is a mobile uh, process for vaccines. What we've done this week is, is we provided um, vaccines in assisted living facilities. Um, we are going to continue to um, span out and be able to provide some working with nonprofit partners that typically provide services to um, elderly populations. But we definitely want to be um, in a space from a mobile perspective that we can um, provide vaccines to people that are elderly, disabled, um, and include their caregivers. Uh, I'll add on to that. Um, you know, the, the challenge is that in the 1B group already, who have already registered through Austin Public Health, we have about 180,000 people and we have 12,000 vaccines coming a week. Uh, it's already challenging to meet the needs for the 1B individuals themselves and the 1A individuals themselves. Uh, so it, it's, not, it's not practical for us at this stage to, to vaccinate all of the family members of all of those people. Um, certainly as, you know, as more vaccine becomes available, uh, then we will we will expand the the scope of of who can get the vaccine, um, but you know I imagine again our next step after one B is one C, which will be uh, essential workers still working in in frontline uh, positions, face to face positions. Uh, that's going to uh, to lead to increased risk uh, of exposure. Uh, so we'll have to be patient and watch uh, the state's recommendations from the the allocation panel. And uh, again, we are certainly ready to, to shift strategy as, uh, as the state allows. This is our final question, and it's from the Austin American Statesman. What is Austin Public Health doing to help residents who may have some distrust in science or the healthcare system still trust the vaccines that are currently on the market? 
have any of these efforts from APH proven successful? One of the things that has um, been helpful that we have started is, is we have started to attend um, town hall sessions uh, as well as um, other platforms where we are virtually engaging um, with folks to talk with them about the vaccines and um, just being transparent and providing the information that we have present. One of the things that we always say as a disclaimer is that the information that I am providing you today is as good as today um, because things are going to change um, as, as more information is, is, is developed and um, as time goes on with this vaccine. In addition to that, um, we have some um, providers and partners um, that have, um, have worked with us along the way to ensure that we are reaching um, target populations. So it's, it's important about the relationships that we have with grassroots organizations. We have some um, seven um, contracts that are many grant contracts. They're going to be doing outreach and education um, in our community. But we know um, as we move along, there will be people that will be hesitant to take the vaccine. We know that there are some folks that will wait for others to take the vaccine that may be of an, an influence to them. And so we want to definitely work with those partners um, and, you know, even look at the locations of where we're providing vaccines. We know that, um, you know, we're in a couple of communities, but we may need to change to locations um, like um, churches. Um, we also may need to, um, you know, partner, um, you know, at um, housing authority, um, locations um, using some of their facilities. So as more vaccines become available, we've got to be able to use those strategies and meet people where they are. Thank you. At this time, Stephanie, we'll start with our closing remarks. We know that um, there are several concerns about the weather. Um, we're going to do everything we can to communicate with you uh, in the event that we may need to close our vaccine sites due to weather. Um, I cannot t tell you how concerned I am about the data uh, with the number of African Americans that have received the vaccine thus far. Also, um, the number of Hispanic people that have received the vaccine. I am going to um, have some meetings with leaders in our community so I can hear from them directly um, and get, you know, their support to say, you know, let's all join in together to work together with Austin Public Health. Our task force have worked um, very closely together throughout this process, and we are going to continue to work with them and receive feedback from them. We know that Austin Public Health cannot do this work alone. We do, in the meantime, do ask folks to um, really continue to wear your mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands, and stay home if you're not feeling well. At this time, I'll transition over to Dr. Escott. Thank you, Stephanie. And again, uh, Austin and Travis County, you're doing a great job. Uh, our case numbers are coming down, our hospitalizations are coming down, and I think that's a testament to the, the work people are doing to decrease the spread of disease. We are concerned, however, that uh, new variants may create a challenge for us. So we have to be vigilant about those protective actions. We have to stay the course, and it's, it's important for us to uh, decrease the spread of COVID-19 now more than ever to decrease the risk of the variant spreading and also to decrease the risk of new variants forming. Uh, so together we can get through this and uh, certainly have a much brighter and, and happier summer this year than last year. And I'll just add that um, as a reminder, our testing locations with Austin Public Health are closed uh, until through Saturday. Uh, if you can consult our website to see when those uh, test sites will reopen. 
Um, and I would just like to say, you know, just kind of uh, reemphasize what Dr. Escott and D Director Hayden Howard have said that um, we need to remain vigilant. Uh, currently, we do have vaccine on board. Uh, we are making ever every effort to reach out to people. Uh, as we reach out to people, be reminded that we will not be asking for financial information for payment. Uh, we will not be asking for social security numbers or um, um, your immigration status. So um, feel confident if, if you receive a call from Austin Public Health to schedule your appointment uh, that we will not be asking for that information. And again, to remain vigilant as far as our uh, disease prevention measures so that we can minimize the risk uh, of exposure and transmission of COVID-19 and the variants that are cir currently circulating out there. Um, you know, limit your social gatherings. We still need to, to be safe uh, and and keep our families safe. Uh, and with that, I'll just wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. That concludes our media availability for today. Thanks to APH Director Stephanie Hayden Howard, Dr. Mark Escott, and Chief Epidemiologist Janet Pichette, and to our pool reporter, Luis Acosta from Univision. Thanks for joining us and please be safe.